Okay, thanks, Gabby. Um, yeah, I'm very glad to be here. This is a, a very, uh, very interdisciplinary and interesting uh, uh, summer school. Uh, apologies for not being able to attend the very first part, but I was on holidays with my wife, and if I cancelled those holidays, I would have probably reached the limits of life of my marriage. So, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, another apology is um, I am an engineer. <laughs> How many engineers are in the uh, in the room? Okay. Okay. Very good. So. Um, what we are going to talk about today is, is a, again, a very interdisciplinary subject, which is eco-hydraulics. And you, you will have the view from, from, you know, from an engineer like me. So I'm trying to convince you today that limits of life, non-dimensional analysis, um, studies that really belong to the, to the ecology and, 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 and the, the, the science, really, actually have a very important engineering um, application. Um, <coughs> I started working on uh, eco-hydraulics, so the interact. For me, eco-hydraulics will give a better definition later on. But for me, eco-hydraulics, the way I intend it is the interaction between hydraulics and fish. That's what I do, and that's what we are going to talk today. It's not the case. Eco-hydraulics is a much wider subject. But uh, again, I was saying I started working on these say five, six years ago when I went to Southampton and I started working with a fish biologist. A fish biologist who works in a, a faculty of engineering, which is quite unusual. His name is Paul Kemp. And we started chatting together. I was literally dragged into, into the subject and I really loved it. It's, it's a fascinating subject. But again, it's very interdisciplinary. I was doing the hydrodynamics part. I'm a, I do fluid mechanics in my, in my, um, in my research. So my knowledge of biology, of fish biology, fish physiology, um, I learned it a little bit, but clearly um, I always needed Paul to back me up. I'm going to show you something today about uh, fish biology and fish physiology. But uh, I mean, it's not exactly my subject, but I'll try to cover it the, mm, as good as I can. Um, we have three hours to spend today. Gabby called them a, a lecturing marathon. <laughs> Um, so um, the lectures are split in two slots. There is one slot this morning when, uh, that uh, uh, will cover a general definition of eco-hydraulics, uh, life in moving fluids, and will be essentially a background lecture covering all the topics that will be needed to better understand the lecture this, morning, um, this afternoon, sorry, um, which is about um, research, some sort of research topics I'm, I'm working on and I would like to, to share with you. So again, this morning we're going to talk about eco-hydraulics and life in moving fluids. There will be a first sub-slot, uh, which I call the Lecture 1.1, which is an introduction to eco-hydraulics and some uh, uh, typical subjects. In the second part, after a break, uh, we'll talk about swimming and living in hydrodynamically complex uh, um, environments. Um, I think the first uh, uh, sub-slot is going to be shorter than the second. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll play it by the ear, okay? If, uh, but feel free to ask questions, to interrupt me anytime if you have curiosities on uh, anything else. Uh, no problem um, at all. Um, so, an introduction to eco-hydraulics and fish locomotion. Uh, what is eco-hydraulics? Well, the, as the word suggests, this is an interdisciplinary dis um, uh, subject at the interface between uh, ecology and hydraulics. Essentially, we are trying to investigate how hydrodynamics, mainly in open channel flows, influence uh, ecosystems, essentially. And I really like the, the definition of Catopodis, who said eco-hydraulics deals with, with a trilogy of, of subjects. One is habitat and ecosystem restoration, including uh, dam removal and wetland rehabilitation. Dam removal now is a, is a hot topic. Nobody really knows how to remove efficiently and sustainable dams uh, because they represent um, um, a barrier for fish migration and for other many other problems. They, uh, they need to be removed in many parts of the world, so like in Brazil, in Canada, there are works uh, in the US, there are um, works in that, uh, in that field. Uh, the other typical subject is ecological flows. Essentially, is the way of defining what is the flow that organisms like in rivers. So what, what defines a good ecosystem, ecosystem from an hydrodynamic point of view? 
And then there is the last uh, subject, which is today's focus, which is passage systems for migration of fish and other aquatic organisms. Forget about the other aquatic organisms. We are going to talk about, about fish. That's what uh, um, uh, this lecture will, uh, will actually cover. And uh, there you go. You probably all know better than me, fish migrates and move in rivers or from the ocean to the rivers and vice versa. And uh, the, the, the big issue, as I was introducing earlier on, is that rivers are heavily fragmented by man-made structures, okay, weirs, dams, and these um, structures represent barriers to their movement, so that we are essentially in impeding fish to um, uh, in fish reproduction, so they are not able to reach the habitat they, they use for spawning and, um, and so forth. And this is a big problem and is causing the depletion of fish stocks around the world. The, uh, the, 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 the stocks of eels are, are depleting really, really, really fast, which is a big problem commercially as well as from an ecosystem point of view. Okay? It's, uh, it's a big problem, especially felt and well-funded in Northern Europe. Not so much now in Italy, where I work. Uh, we are a bit behind, but uh, it's gaining momentum also, also, also there. Um, there is, a, there is a, a, a picture here on, the, on your um, uh, right-hand side here showing some salmons jumping over a waterfall. So you may say, okay, these barriers you know, fish are very, very strong. They can jump and overcome them. Well, certainly they cannot overcome dams like these. <laughs> these are really, really large and represent uh, um, impermeable barriers for, for, for fish. As you know, dams are used very often for either power purposes. So uh, whenever fish migrating either upstream or migrating downstream, so upstream means going from the ocean to the, to the, to the spawning habitat, upstream indeed, or, or, or swimming from uh, upstream, to, meaning towards, um, uh, towards the ocean. That's, um, whenever they do that, they actually uh, they encounter threats because they might actually take the spillways <laughs> and make a big, a big, big jump here that would kill them, or they actually may swim through the through the turbines of the of the hydropower station, and which would most likely kill them as well. So besides representing a barrier, they're also a threat. Another typical structure that represent a barrier are, um, uh, are weirs. This is a weir in on the river Po in Turin, where I live. And as you can see on the downstream side of the weir, there are very uh, fast and shallow uh, currents that prevent fish to actually swim. So uh, they, are not even, uh, uh, they are not even able to overcome these sort of obstacles. These structures cannot be well, at the time, uh, at the moment, cannot be easily removed because they, they serve important purposes. Uh, as I said, dams are used to produce electricity, and we are really thirsty for energy worldwide. Weirs are, uh, are used for um, usually hydrometric uh, purposes, so they are used to measure discharge in rivers, which is extremely important for water management purposes. So some of them uh, that, that are worldwide, some of them are recognized to be redundant, so they can be removed. Uh, to, uh, so diminish uh, that would diminish the fragmentation of the of the river. But some others cannot be removed. So we need to find solutions that allow these structures to be fish friendly. Essentially, we need to provide passage for for fish. There is a nice uh, um, sort of sketch here that explains the problem. Every time we have a barrier, which, uh, like in this case in here, we need to provide ways for the fish um, to overcome the barrier. Imagine, let's assume this is, we are talking about upstream migration. So fish come here and want to go upstream against the flow. There are two ways, essentially, broadly speaking, uh, although this is a bit brutal, but either we build a, a natural sort of a natural canal that a bypass that allows to to link the upstream and the downstream part of the of, um, around the barrier or we actually can build uh, a, a concrete structures essentially some baffled channels 
were usually quite steep, where these buffers, these roughness elements, are used to um, decrease the flow to and to increase the flow depth, and therefore to allow the fish to swim, uh, um, uh, you know, to rise. These these uh, they are called fish ladders or fish passes. Um, in the design, in the design of these passes, uh, the the questions and the problems we have to address are. First of all, how do we attract fish to the fish pass? That's a big. How how would, how do we how can we let them know? Look, you have to go there, not there. Go there. You know, when we drive, we have signs in the road. That's easy, but fish, you know, don't recognize exactly arrows and, and stuff. So we need to attract them there. And how do we design fish passes? That's another engineering questions. Meaning. Okay, these, uh, usually these barriers are associated with head difference, which are quite substantial, as we have seen in the dam picture uh, earlier on. So usually we have to build, like in this case, if you look on the right-hand side, you know, uh, channels, buffalo channels that are quite steep. So presumably they will be characterized with the high velocities. Can fish sustain these high velocities? Can uh, they actually swim into, the, into these flows? How does um, uh, turbulence and the mean flow and the heterogeneity of the flow within the channel affect swimming performance so that they can actually rise? Shall I do it a longer fish pass, le but less steep, uh, or a steeper fish pass, but short? So that depends on the stamina of the fish, on the fitness of the fish, on, many, on water temperature, on many other things. So it's a very difficult uh, it's called ecological engineering problem. Um, the other mm, problem or question that we have to address, which uh, really uh, pertains very well with uh, issues related to dam and hydropower, is how do we repel fish from dangerous areas? We have seen that we have to attract fish to fish pass, but we also have, we have to find ways to rep mm, mm, that repel fish from the dangerous areas, like spillways, like uh, uh, intakes for the turbines, or like screens. Screens are essentially um, f filters that uh, um, that uh, uh, allow uh, do not allow debris and other things to go into the water intakes of the turbines. These screens are extremely dangerous. I'll show you some pictures this afternoon, I suppose, um, where where um, eels and many fish get impinged and they are not able to swim back. Okay, so that's a killer for for fish. We have to find ways to repel fish from screens, from spillways, and so forth. In summary, it's a big problem. In order to address problems of fish pass, to allow fish migration and fish movement, we need to understand what attracts and what repels uh, fish while migrating. And this belongs to the world of fish behavior, animal behavior in general. Okay? And uh, in this context, uh, there is quite a strong literature now and evidence that the hydrodynamics influence seem to play uh, really a key role in determining um, uh, the fish behavior at this small scale, so in proximity of these structures. Fish behavior is dictated by many things. You know, they are living organisms, so there are curious fish, there are less curious fish, scary, scared fish, fish who are hungry and they are looking for food. Uh, fish who are tired, the fish who are very fit. So everything, uh, fish behavior in general is extremely complex and depends on a huge number of variables. As far as migration is concerned, however, it seems the hydrodynamics plays a key role. The way they respond to hydrodynamics determine, determines where they go, essentially, and whether they go to the fish pass or whether they get trimmed into the turbines. Um, the second, okay, there should be a two here, not a one, but doesn't matter. How do we facilitate swimming in fish passes? And this belongs to the world of uh, fish locomotion, which is, uh, belongs to a huge literature. Okay, there is a lot since the 40s, I suppose, there were, there were uh, uh, no, maybe the 60s, there were, there were models trying to reproduce and to understand fish locomotion more for biomimetic purposes and, 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 and to, to, to get inspired design, underwater vehicles, and, 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 uh, and so forth. 
but uh, it also has applications, as we have seen, in ecological contexts. And uh, uh, we will see that uh, swimming in fish passes is not only about mean velocities. Okay, you know, uh, you have learned probably, uh, you know, from your background or in the summer school, the drag of 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 any object really is is depends on the square of the velocity. If we are in the let's call it inertial regime, um, but it's not only that. Turbulence, size of eddies, influence or may not influence, we still don't know, the, the, the swimming performance of fish. We will see some examples uh, um, this morning. So we have fish behavior and fish locomotion as two macroscopic areas of study to address the problem of fish pass. And there, th there you go. Um, when I say fish behavior, I just want to stress the fact that uh, mm, some species migrate and move individually, some others migrate and move collectively. Uh, and uh, fish behavior at the collective scale is, 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 is yet another discipline of, of, of complexity sciences. Um, collective behavior is that, that there's a lot to talk about. There's no time to talk about collective behavior in uh, today. But I do work on that, on collective behavior of fish. It's a fascinating subject. And... Uh, um, uh, so, if you are curious to know more about that, we can talk. Uh, we can talk later on. Going back to the microscopic picture, we have fish behavior and fish locomotion. To address the problem of fish pass, we need two more, mm, let's say, uh, knowledge of, of, of two more uh, variables. One is, of course, hydrodynamics, and turbulence plays a key role. And the other one is flow sensing. As we will see in a few minutes, uh, uh, fishes are living uh, sensors of pressure and velocity. It's really incredible how they are able to sense the flow around them. And clearly, what they sense oh, sorry, dictate the behavior. Okay? So whatever they, they feel uh, influence their choice of what to do. And this is fairly, fairly intuitive. Hydrodynamics, of course, influences fish locomotion, and fish locomotion meaning swimming ability, swimming performance, and that clearly influences fish behavior as well. A fish will never go to, uh, to, to a fast current if it's not able to sustain the current. Hydrodynamics also influences flow sensing. So uh, these, let's call them physiological <laughs> sensors they have in their body, can be um, can be fooled by turbulence. Okay, so turbulence is a noisy mm, represent a noisy signal for them that can prevent them to actually detect mean velocity gradients or or macroscopic uh, properties of the flow around them that actually would drive their decision that be that behavior. So hydrodynamics and turbulence in general can be uh, can influence a lot flow sensing and in turn fi fish behavior. So. This big picture is a, is a system of, of interconnected uh, blocks. This morning, in this first slot, we are going to talk and uh, learn a little bit uh, more about the fish locomotion and, uh, and flow sensing by fish. Okay, um, I'm going to go really at, um, I would say, a very intuitive level. We'll keep it very, very, very easy and, and, and sweet. Okay, let's talk about fish locomotion. Uh, well, this is a huge world. Uh, fish, fishes come with different size, shape, uh, swimming abilities, and so forth. But overall, <laughs> let's take this as a as a as a, as a template for fish. You know, of this of this shape. There is a caudal fin um, in here in the tail of the fish. The caudal fin is used as an as an airfoil, as a sail. Let's say so the, 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 the zigzagging of the, of the tail and the caudal fin uh, generates this lift and drag forces moving that vary in direction and magnitude during the excursion of the caudal fin in its uh, uh, zigzagging pattern. And overall, these lift and drag forces generate a, a positive. Um, thrust that overcomes the drag of the fish, which is mainly um, skin friction. 
uh, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a fish swims, there, the, 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 there is no, mm, if, if, if the fish was steady and straight, you would see no separation of the boundary layer. So the only source of drag or flow resistance would be the friction between the skin of the fish and the flow itself. Okay? So overall, this caudal fin is responsible for the movement of fish along a longitudinal direction of a velocity u. Um, the lateral fins or the other fins are usually used as um, to stabilize okay, the, 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 the fish in, uh, in water. So that's how it works. The interesting bit is um, uh, these movements of the caudal fin are used then to uh, generate different swimming activities. Okay? You can uh, discern between cruising activity which is uh, when the fish uh, can swim for hours, maintaining this regime of swimming for hours, and this swimming causes no major physiological change in the organisms in, in the fish itself. Okay, so sort of a walk. Then there is the burst activity. The burst activity, which is ecologically extremely um, uh, important uh, and also important for an engineering point of view, is when the fish essentially mm, runs, goes really, really fast to overcome some very fast current or to escape from a predator, for example. And this requires a sustained and intense effort that cannot be maintained usually for more than a uh, few seconds to tens of seconds, okay? That depends on many, many things. We are going to see this very, very soon, um, among which there is also water temperature. Uh, usually when it's very, very cold, fish are more lazy. When it's hotter, the water is, is warmer, so they are much more active and able to, do, uh, to, to, to swim a lot faster. There is something in between called sustained activity, uh, which has a very blurry definition, and, and it's, uh, it's not very relevant in my opinion. What really, really I'm interested in, and I think has a, has a, has a lot of ecological and engineering value, is the definition of burst activity or maximum speed. Okay? Uh, this is important for the design of fish passes that are usually characterized by very steep slopes and fast currents. So that's what we need to, uh, to know about fish. What is the maximum speed they can, uh, they can reach and for how long? If I know their maximum speed and for how long they can sustain it, I've got speed times time, I've got a length, I can design the length of my of my fish pass, I know that most fishes will be able to to rise and and overcome the obstacle uh, the fish pass is is helping to overcome. Um, so, what determines uh, maximum speed limits in different fish species is a big question. There is a lot of literature on this, and while reviewing the material for this summer school, I encountered this very very recent paper uh, published in Nature Ecology by a German group, actually, uh, well, it's mixed. I think there is um, also UK University and uh, um, somebody else, I, I don't remember. It's, it's, uh, it's quite a few authors involved. And it's very, very interesting. Um, they pose the questions, um, in general, the largest animals are not the fastest. Okay, a lion is faster than, than, than an elephant. Uh, so why? And the question is, uh, makes sense because if you think about it, mm, you know, the largest animals have larger muscles, they are bigger, they have more power. So in principle, they should run faster than smaller animals. And usually this uh, maximum theoretical velocity V uh, uh, has an allometric <coughs> relationship with mass. Uh, it's, it's a power law essentially where A and B are two coefficients that depends on, 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 on the species and so forth. Um, the explanation they give for this counterintuitive result is, is based on, um, on the acceleration and on the stamina, essentially, of, of animals. A mouse is able to reach, to saturate its velocity very quickly, can accelerate very, very qui quickly, reach its ma maximum velocity and keep it. An elephant, although has a theoretical velocity, which is really, really high because it's very powerful, has many muscles, accelerates very, very slowly, it gets tired before it can actually reach the, 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 the asymptotic velocity. Okay? So, so it's a, it's a trade-off between power 
and, and stamina, essentially. And they developed uh, a nice model, quite simple, and they tested it uh, against different species, um, flying, running, and swimming, and, and they all show this maxima, okay? Flying, they have the maximum speed, so on the y-axis here you have the speed, on the x-axis you have the body mass, okay? So essentially there is a maximum, meaning that the largest, the biggest animals are not the fastest. The intermediate animals are actually the fastest for uh, flying, uh, arthropods, mammals, reptiles, and also for swimming animals like, uh, like fish, you can see that there is clearly a maximum around, say, uh, 100 kilograms. Like tuna in the sea are really, really fast, or a marlin. They, I think they can go up to 15 meters per second. That's, that's very, very, very fast. And uh, when I read this paper, I found it really, really uh, fascinating and very, very, uh, let's say, um, um, well, uh, consistent with this summer school. But I was surprised that this study did not um, include or mention another very interesting study by uh, Ozilevsky and Weiss of 2008, where they actually um, did um, an analysis, a very complicated one, uh, using airfoil theory, uh, trying to find the limits, the speed limits of fish. And the results of their analysis is fascinating. They say that small swimmers, say one meter long, are limited by power, as before. So the largest fish, in principle, uh, have more muscle, so they can go faster. Small fish, they don't have enough power. They're very, very small, so they reach uh, lower velocities. Large swimmers, who in principle have really large masses, so very strong muscles and have a lot of, of stored power in their body, are actually limited by cavitation, which is fascinating. Um, essentially, when a fish starts uh, sweeping the, the fin, if it sweeps it too fast, the water around the fin itself will experience really high velocities. And uh, if you remember the Bernoulli theorem in fluid dynamics, if you have really high velocities, what happens is the pressure drops, right? Now, you can boil water either increasing the, the temperature of it or by decreasing a lot the, the water pressure. Whenever this pressure goes beyond a certain limit, bubbles uh, that forms from nuclei that are naturally present in water start to expand. And whenever these bubbles travel in the flow and reach some areas where the pressure is restored, they start oscillating. These bubbles uh, behave, uh, the behavior of bubbles is, is explained by the rayleigh plessis equation, uh, which is a complicated differential equation although an ordinary differential equation, which is good. But anyway, they are very non-linear uh, oscillators that eventually lead to collapse. When a bubble collapses, collapses really violently. Inside the bubble, you may have pressures up to 1,000 atmospheres. Uh, cavitation is used for, for many purposes. Uh, usually, uh, hydrodynamicists like to avoid it because they uh, this Cavitation bubbles are able to break uh, propellers, like, like in these pictures. You see, this is the damage of cavitation around these uh, ship propellers. So they can really break everything. And so they can really break and damage fish tails, essentially. And there are the, some pictures, which I couldn't find, unfortunately. Apologies for that, of, of tails, I think, of tuna fish being damaged by cavitation. Tuna can afford to reach cavitation because they have bony tails, so they don't have nerve system, but they don't feel pain. But dolphins really do feel pain in, the, in, the, in their tails, so they, are av they avoid to actually trigger cavitation because that would really, really hurt. So for tuna, cavitation is a problem. It sets a limit for the, for the speed velocity because whenever you have cavitation around the, um, uh, any airfoil or any propeller, the efficiency, essentially, of the propeller decreases a lot. You reach a sort of what is called a, a cavitation stall, okay, where, 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 where thrust diminishes a lot. Um, 
So my question when I was reading uh, this paper, on the one hand, you have the velocity and acceleration mm, uh, concept developed by, the, by Hirt and, 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 and um, co-workers. And they, and they say that that explains uh, this maximum in the, in the speed versus body mass diagram. I wonder whether cavitation plays a role in that. Uh, it was not mentioned, but I think, uh, I think it would. Um, regarding mm, what I'm working on in eco in econ hydraulics, um, we are working essentially in this tail of the curve mm, because we deal mainly with freshwater. Well, uh, in this lecture, we will deal mainly on freshwater fish. So we are here. We don't reach the size of, of whales and, <laughs> and so forth uh, in rivers like in the oceans. So this is not um, a big deal. But um, definitely, as a general concept, in my opinion, cavitation should, should, be, uh, taken, um, should be taken into account. Let me just go back to the previous slide. An interesting thing is that uh, cavitation sets speed limits, especially when fish is swimming close to the surface, so say at depths that are less than 10, 15 meters, where pressures are low. If you go deeper, in the ocean, clearly you, you, the fish are experience very, very high pressures and cavitation is limited because it's very difficult to boil the water. So perhaps mm, deep inside the ocean, fish can go really, really fast, but close to the surface at the depths that are of interest for uh, also for freshwater problems, um, definitely cavitation can represent uh, a phenomenon dictating uh, speed limits. Um, and this is uh, um, about it for fish locomotion. We will see uh, this afternoon how fish behaves and, and deals with, uh, with turbulent flows. Um, uh, later on, for some, you know, we will go into detail on that. Now, let me just uh, uh, keep going with the description of background material. And uh, let's talk now a little bit about flow sensing. Flow sensing by fish uh, is, is, is incredible, in my opinion. And there is, I, I have taken this paragraph from a paper by um, Horst Blackman and Zelig. Horst Blackman is a, is a scientist based here in Germany, in Bonn. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to one of his seminars. He's an excellent scientist working on the, on the mechanosensory uh, system of fishes. Uh, it's really fascinating what he does. Uh, uh, and during this seminar, um, I was really fascinated, so I, I, I dig deeper into the, into the topic and found out really interesting things. Essentially, as you can see from this picture, fishes, the, the surface, the skin of, of fishes is covered by um, uh, some little dots in here that represent, uh, well, they are, they are called neuromasts and are spread around the body mostly into uh, this line, which is called the lateral line, and all these neuromasts as are used to sense the flow, to measure pressure and velocity around, around the fish. And there are so many and mostly concentrated in, uh, in the head. Um, neuromasts divide in superficial neuromasts, where there are um, some cupola here, essentially. These are sort of slender objects. Um, uh, essentially protruding into the flow or let's say into the boundary layer forming around the fish itself. We are talking about microscopic scales here, so they are really, really, really small. Okay? And when they are exposed to the flow, they bend and they send a signal to the nerve central nerve system which uh, analyzes this signal and dictates, okay, here there is a high velocity or a high shear stress perhaps more appropriately. And uh, um, uh, the fact that they are small is, is uh, allows them to have really high resolution. And working in very small Reynolds number means that these sensors are working what is called the creeping flow approximation. Okay, so when you have really, really ro low Reynolds number, it means that these bodies essentially have no inertia. So they respond immediately to the fish. What is inertia? Uh, large animals <laughs> like me, when we swim, Okay, whenever you stroke, you give one stroke, you keep going. Okay, you, that, that's inertia. You, you, have, uh, you, you, you keep moving into water without uh, stroking again. 
in the microscopic world, like those in bacteria, if they want to swim, they have to move continuously because they have no iner inertia. Okay, they, if they if they if they beat their tail, those bacteria who have tail, um, they stop immediately. Okay, because there is a, the creeping flow approximation is essentially a balance between pressure forces and viscous forces. Essentially. So there is no inertia. Or inertia is very very negligible. So these sort of uh, sensors uh, respond immediately to the flow. Uh, the other uh, building block of the of the lateral uh, line is called the canal neuromast. So in the fish body, there are some uh, only small canals, a bit larger than the new the superficial neuromast. Uh, th these are literally um, manometers, essentially. You have two holes which are connected to the outside. Uh, sorry, by a, by an underskin canal. And uh, the water inside this microscopic canal is driven by the pressure difference between one hole and the other. And this pressure difference uh, drives the flow inside, um, inside the, 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 the canal, and the, the cupola, so the sensor, characteristic sensor of the fish, starts uh, not bending because it has a bit more a blunt structure, but slides, okay? And the degree to which this the cupola slides depends on the flow velocity and in turn on the, on the pressure difference. So in general, you may say superficial neuromasts, which from now on we will call SN, are sensors for velocity, okay? Or for the boundary layer velocity, which is a big problem. Uh, canal, <laughs> we'll see why. Canal neuromasts are sensors for pressure, pressure differences, okay? that in turbulent waters uh, or, or even in calm waters uh, can be very, very small. And they're actually able really to detect really small variations. Okay, for example, uh, you can have hydrodynamic uh, stimuli by insects moving on the, on the surface of a lake. Fish are able to actually detect them and go and catch them, all right? Or eddies uh, generated by, uh, well, self-generated eddies, or it is generated by other fish in, uh, in, in close proximity. This is a, a picture of the superfi superficial neuroma neuromasts. You see these, these small dots in here. And uh, there is also, there are also stained uh, uh, canal neuromasts in here, as you can see. The pore associated with canal neuromasts is slightly larger than the superficial neuromast uh, um, itself. There is this, perhaps we could switch off the light here. Uh, there is this nice picture of, of uh, I think this is a, mm, well, I don't remember what sort of fish, this, what species, thanks. This is, but you can see um, all the neuromasts in the fish skin. Um, figure B, you can see the canal neuromast, which has a larger diameter. Than the superficial, um, uh, than the superficial neuromast. Um, again, the superficial neuromast work as a, 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 as a with bending moments essentially and measure the flow velocity. As we said, the, the cupola inside the water, uh, the canal neuromast, which is slightly larger, instead glides. And there are these uh, kinocilium, stereocilia, this hair bundle. Now we are going deeper into the physiology of fish, which I am not really confident with, but essentially they are responsible for generating the signal that then is transferred to the central nerve system and, uh, and an analyzed by the fish to work out the velocity field. Um, now, the distribution number and size of superficial and canal neuromasts varies incredibly a lot among uh, fish species. Um, understanding why is definitely a very active um, area of research. There is a, an example here of three species, and you can see the number and the distribution of the canal neuromass is, is really, really, um, really, really high. Um, however, there is a speculation saying that it seems that uh, a fish with superficial neuromass uh, abundance lives in calm water, let's say lakes, something like that. 
um, whereas fish with abundance of canal neuromas like uh, well are associated with uh, um, turbulent and faster waters um, the literature on this is contradictory somebody says it's true somebody else find no whatsoever link between um, habitat and uh, um, uh, characteristics of the lateral line to me uh, I don't really have an explanation why superficial neuromasts are more useful in calm waters than, uh, than canal neuromasts. My interpretation is that uh, um, superficial neuromasts measure velocities that are, let's go back to these slides, are mediated by the boundary layer. Okay, so around the fish, whenever the fish moves, there is a boundary layer forming. And what they measure, since they're really, really small, is the velocity in the boundary layer. So there is a sort of a filter effect of what's really going on outside. Canal neuromasts uh, measure pressure differences. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with boundary layer theory, but uh, uh, in a thin boundary layer, the fact that the boundary layer is very, very thin dictates the fact that uh, the, the pressure over the direction perpendicular to the surface locally is actually constant. Okay, so whatever they measure is, is, is very much uh, linked to what's actually going on outside the boundary layer, so what they really, really m want to measure. So, to me, it kind of makes sense that fish who want to live in the in turbulent waters have developed a system of canal neuromas, which is which is more, um, sorry, a, a number of um, neuromas that is more skewed towards canal neuromas rather than superficial neuromas. But that's my <laughs> interpretation. It could be totally, totally. Is the interpretation again of, of a fluid dynamicist, which should be integrated within a, a biological framework, which, um, which is something that is, as I said, um, a, an active uh, research uh, area. Um, how are we doing with time? Hmm. Almost there. Um, anyway, there is a general trend in terms of neuromast uh, density. It seems that they are more concentrated uh, towards the head of the fish and then they uh, slowly uh, decrease in density along uh, the body of the fish itself. This is of great interest not only for, uh, um, um, uh, for ecological uh, purposes. Uh, many scientists uh, are trying to uh, reproduce the lateral line of fish so that they can use it in underwater uh, 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 systems to detect uh, 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 obstacles and so forth, uh, instead of sonars, es es essentially. And um, let me just stress something which is very, very fascinating. Fish use the lateral line for many purposes. So they essentially detect what's going on from a fluid dynamics point of view around them to detect uh, prey or predators, uh, to communicate, to do schooling. Schooling is a, it means essentially when they, w w when they want to, to stay together, to fill, to to uh, to, um, to follow each other in a coordinated manner, and also for object discrimination. So, incredibly, fish. If you put a blind fish or a or, or a fish in total darkness within a bath, and you put a lot of obstacles, the fish starts mm, doing some tail beats, moves the water around, get the signal back from a fluid dynamics perspective, and has a sort of an hydrodynamic picture of the obstacle around the fish. And there is a nice, hopefully it will go, video of a blind cave fish. This is a blind fish that was, that was immersed in this, in this uh, bucket, essentially. And uh, scientists uh, monitored is its movements. It's completely blind, you can't see, but as you can see, he's able well, it seems that he is touching the, the, the obstacles, but actually is not. So he's able to avoid them just by uh, self-propelling, and, uh, and he never hurts it himself. And uh, to me, that's really, uh, really, really uh, incredible. Uh, the lateral line uh, is a system. There you go. which is key uh, for, the, for the health of fish whenever you, um, you um, um, 
you, you switch off the lateral line, you can do that. I think with the with some anesthetics, uh, biologists can do that. The, the fish are not able really to discriminate what's what's around them, so you really uh, impede the, their life heavily. Um, and as we'll see, the uh, understanding how the lateral line works, what exactly is the hydrodynamic signature felt by the fish, as we will see this afternoon, has huge implications, even from an engineering point of view. Slightly off topic, we talked about flow sensing. Uh, sight is also <laughs> very much used by fish, and uh, this summer school, well, this lecture is a bit uh, um, a mix of hydrodynamics and fish biology, and how the two, uh, how hydrodynamics has shaped fish, perhaps. And uh, what's really, really interesting is that, uh, well, the the position of eyes in fish um, is is really, really clever. So whenever a fish move, uh, due to the movement itself, there is a pressure field generating around the fish. We will have some high pressure around the head and a little bit low pressure close to the tail. High pressure has the potential of distorting uh, the, 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 the essentially the, the eyes of the fish and, that and therefore the vision of fish. But nature really shaped the position of, of the eyes in proximity of the coefficient of pressure, where the coefficient of pressure of the fish is actually zero. CP, the coefficient of pressure, is nothing but the difference between the, 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 the pressure and uh, uh, pressure infinity, is the background pressure, normalized by the, uh, the, the kinetic energy, uh, the kinetic head, essentially, of the current where the fish is, is holding position, or the, the, the velocity itself of the fish if the, the, the water is standing. So whenever this CP is zero, that means essentially that the pressure in proximity of, of the fish um, surface uh, is equal to the background pressure. And that's where the eyes of the fish are located. So their vision is not, uh, um, is not um, uh, distorted uh, while uh, swimming. Um, this is a list of reference that uh, I've used to, this, to do this uh, first uh, um, uh, slot of lecture. Um, they represent by no means uh, a complete literature review but, the review, but they can be considered as a seed to branch out okay, and, and read more and learn more about uh, all these topics uh, that we have covered. As far as I understand, now it's time for a for a for a for a break, uh, ten minutes uh, break. But if there are questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to discuss, of course, or curiosities or, or, or anything. Okay. Um, all good to start for the recording videos. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, welcome back. So. Um, uh, we are now going to the uh, second slot of this morning lectures, which is about swimming and living in hydrodynamically complex environments. So if we go back to the initial big picture of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, the, first, uh, of the first slot, uh, now we have learned a little bit more about fish locomotion. We have learned um, how fish sense the flow. What remains to be addressed is a little bit of hydro hydrodynamics. Um, uh, so, what's actually in rivers? What 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 uh, uh, what sort? Of what is the environment that they live in? And rivers are definitely hydrodynam very hydrodynamically complex environments. Um, uh, this is a nice picture of a river in New Zealand, and uh, you can see it's it's a meandering river that uh, will show clearly strong velocity gradient, so there will be a heterogeneity in the, in the mean flow. Uh, and obviously, mm, most rivers are a flow in the turbulent regime. Um, and turbulence is a very, very <laughs> complex phenomenon. I pr perhaps I shouldn't use the word complex. Complex sciences, now it's, it's, uh, it's something else. It belongs to the world of collective behavior and, and the, the emergence of macroscopic um, phenomena out of the interaction of individual elements. Uh, perhaps I should say complicated, okay? So it's <laughs> turbulence is complicated. It's, it's also complex in, in, in uh, according to, to some theory, but 
uh, what I'm talking here today is about the complicated things, things that uh, give headaches. Uh, let's start with turbulence. Uh, okay, here there is a little bit of material that perhaps is, is redundant. Uh, I think you have uh, had the chance to learn what turbulence is and the phenomenology during previous lectures, so I'll go a little bit fast. But uh, an open uh, channel flow is a high Reynolds number flow, so it is exposed to hydrodynamic instabilities that generate this building block of turbulence, which are eddies or scales of motion. Eddies in general extract energy from the mean flow, so it, turbulence is a dissipative uh, phenomenon, and uh, eventually dissipates uh, this energy into heat through the energy cascade going from large vortices to small vortices. I'm not going to go farther into this because I'm, uh, I assume you know that. And uh, the if we uh, if we take a pictorial view of turbulence based on the on uh, on, on on spectra of turbulence spectra. We can identify uh, three ranges of turbulence going from the large scale eddies, which contains most of the energy, and then through an intermediate range, which is called the inertial subrange, where uh, the scales of motion lose memory of the, of the large scales in the flow, uh, but still viscosity is not uh, important. And then at the high wave numbers, so at very small scales, viscosity kicks in, energy dissipated into it. A heat. Um, the intermediate range is usually called the inertial subrange, and uh, farther down in the wave number, there is this dissipation range. They are both kind of predictable theoretically. There are some issues here at the at the overlap, which <laughs> we have worked on, but uh, but we we have good predictions based on theoretical principles. What really gives problems are the large, the energy containing eddies, and these. Large eddies influence essentially facial locomotion. Okay, you can, and this is pretty easy to imagine a, a, a vortex of this size. Well, whenever you have fish of a certain size and fork length, which is just the length of the fish, the eddies that, that that will influence its swimming ability will be an eddy of the same size, roughly or larger. So we are definitely in the energy-containing regime when we talk about fish turbulence. Uh, um, interaction and unfortunately for us, uh, these large scale eddies are unpredictable, are, are case dependent. And in rivers, you may have, I mean, uh, all sort of uh, <laughs> eddies generated by different uh, 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 by different uh, um, uh, conditions. And this is a, a large eddies generated by river confluence, which is. It's this kind of mixing layer type of turbulence that influences the the the, 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 the dispersion of of, uh, of sediment. Um, then you have we may have uh, wakes, okay, turbulent wakes around obstructions that are uh, heavily found in rivers. This can be man-made structures like uh, like bridges with column, well, cylindrical elements protruding the free surface. These give rise of very coherent vortices, columnar vortices, um, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that form in proximity of the cylinders. And this is very, very topical in fish research. We will see that most experiments are done in, in wake turbulence because that, uh, uh, that triggers a special behavior of fish. There are also rocks and logs in torrents that uh, fish use as a refuge or mm, that fish exploit to minimize energy consumption and to, um, or to hold station. Um, the, uh, the, the simple, let's consider the simplest case of a straight rectangular channel that you can have in a flume, so in a laboratory. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about this because most experiments on fish are done in the lab and so uh, the turbulence properties that are um, that are um, investigated belong to, you know, um, are essentially um, within the context of, of wall turbulence because open channel flows usually have the depth which is much smaller than the than the width of the channel where they flow. So most of the turbulence is generated by essentially by the. Mm, the, the friction between uh, the water and the, and, the, and the bed of the channel, okay? And this may be a simplistic 
view but actually generates very complicated turbulence we still don't understand and this worries me a lot because if we don't understand turbulence in a laboratory where everything is <laughs> is controlled there is a straight channel shallow water everything is nice i mean uh, think about trying to model and understand these rivers here i mean it worries me a lot but uh, that's what we have and uh, in um, so in, a, in, a, in, the, in the idealized case of a straight open channel flow, uniform flow, uh, the energy containing eddies in rivers uh, somewhat relate to what are called uh, hairpin eddies. Okay? Turbulence can, uh, it's a very chaotic phenomenon, but not completely chaotic. There are some coherent structures, that's what they are called, that are responsible for uh, uh, um, triggering most of transport. Okay, momentum, scala, and so forth, as you probably have learned in, pre in, in past lectures in this, in this summer school. And these higher pin headies are coherent structures that scale somewhat linearly from, from the bed. They grow in size when you, uh, when you go um, uh, away from the bed. And they really have the shape of an higher pin. These are flow visualization from numerical simulations of of, of, of past papers. Uh, okay, the visualization is a complicated uh, uh, issue. Um, essentially, uh, there are techniques based on the velocity gradient tensor, but that does, doesn't matter, that are allowed to find these ISO surfaces of, 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 of swirling, essentially, the swirling property of, um, of, of, of an eddy and, uh, uh, and, and uh, how this distributes. So uh, they capture the coherence of, of this, um, of lumps of fluids that, that share the same swirly, swirling power in a very, very intuitive way. And there are nice, uh, um, a nice flow visualization. This is a higher pin forest that was captured by uh, uh, Wu and Moin in 2009, which is really impressive in a flat boundary layer. Red means very high longitudinal velocities, blue lower velocities. And you can really uh, see that these um, hairpin vortices, uh, hairpin eddies forming um, in the near wall region or in the near bed region in case of, of, of open channel flows, then organizes into packets. Essentially, <laughs> A brutal description of wall turbulence can be said that is made by individual higher pin eddies that then um, organizes into packets. So in many higher pin eddies that these packets have a coherence themselves and form what, what are called a class of large scales. Okay? So large scales are uh, assist packets of these higher pin eddies, which is really the building block of energy containing eddies in, uh, in, in, um, in, in open channels. Well, in any wall flows really. Um, these large scale motions, uh, well let's say these large scale eddies divides in large scale motions, LSM, which are packets of higher pins, and then there are also very large scale motions <laughs> <laughs> to make things more confusing, which are packets of packets. <laughs> okay, but the building block according to the, 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 the current paradigms, is always the Arpin vortex, uh, the Arpin eddies, essentially. Um, open channel flows are uh, quite peculiar. According to the latest experiments of Vlad Nikora's group in Aberdeen, they have a very fancy flume and PAV system, and they did measurements of open channel flows over spheres, uh, bearing, uh, keeping the sphere diameter constant and bearing the flow depth. Okay, and they they did spectral analysis uh, to capture the peak in the spectra that correspond to these large scale motions and very large scale motions, and they provided some scaling. Uh, on the if you look at this picture in here, there is the normalized size, let's call it, of LSM large scale motion and very large scale motions VLSM. Okay, normalized with the flow depth. If you see large scale motions or packets of airpins um, are independent on the on the what is called the submergence, the ratio between the flow depth and the diameter of spheres, very large scale motion seems to be um, very much dependent according to different uh, um, submergence conditions, okay, which correspond to different symbols in here. Um, the this, I mean, is probably a little bit off topic today, but uh, I thought it was interesting. 
uh, to show you that, I mean, there are scales that are up to 50 times the flow depth. So if you have a river one meter deep, you have scales of turbulence that are long, 50 meters long. Why? What is the origin of these scales? Big question. Uh, but what I really would like you to remember just for this lecture is that these large scale eddies, LSM, VLSM, doesn't really matter, scales with the flow depth. Okay? So they are x times the flow depth. That's what matters for fish research. Okay? But just to give you a, a, a word of caution, these, these scales are not fully understood. The scaling of these eddies is not fully understood. Actually, uh, Cameron and, and co-workers from Aberdeen suggest that the size of the very large scale motions depends not much on the ratio between the flow depth and, uh, and the um, roughness diameter, so the roughness scales, but rather on the, on the width of the channel and the flow depth, which is why? I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me because I don't have an answer, but it's an open question. It's very interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, clearly, what's plotted in here is just the maxima of these curves, okay? Because the size of the very large scale motions uh, varies across the, um, across the vertical, um, the vertical uh, um, axis, okay? Um, why should it scale with the, with the width of the channel? I don't know. Um, I thought that perhaps another land scale that may get into the uh, equation should be the, the fetch over which the, the boundary layer develops. Okay? If I have uh, one meter flow depth, then I need a, a flume that is at least, well, much more than 50 meters long to observe this, this, this structure. So perhaps depending on, on, on where you measure, things change. But uh, uh, this is just speculation my own speculation. Um, there you go, these are uh, a visualization of these very large scale motions. They look like, uh, I don't know, elongated sausages really. They, they are really uh, sort of meandering structures. Uh, you see these are, um, uh, the color bar here indicates velocity, longitudinal velocity fluctuations. These stripes in here are different experiments. Uh, let's focus on this experiment in here, which has the higher uh, domain, the, the larger domain. You see stripes of high momentum and low momentum here that are really, really, really long and, uh, and meandering. And that's what very large scale motions look like. They're elongated structures uh, moving um, around. Um, and obviously, this is a, a, is a top view, okay, this is from, uh, from above. Imagine that this is your flume and you are putting a camera on top and observing how these scales develop, okay? So big, big, big headies. Um, another thing that I need to introduce to interpret the results that I will present, well, not the results, but the, the, the topic that uh, I will present this afternoon is the concept of secondary currents in open channel flows, which is, in my opinion, uh, a peculiarity of, 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 um, of open channel flows themselves. Um, essentially, what you have, doesn't really matter if you have a trapezoidal or a rectangular channel or any other shape, uh, you always have effects of the side walls containing the flow. Okay? These side walls generate some sort of turbulence, heterogeneity, turbulence anisotropy, that is responsible to generate um, the secondary currents that look like cells, in light, but in the mean flow. Okay, so you observe these, these secondary cells in the mean flow. Okay, so it's not directly related to a turbulent properties. I'm saying directly because they are indirectly <laughs> related to turbulence, and we'll see why in a second. Um, the secondary currents uh, are characterized, um, uh, well, essentially they influence the, um, the friction over the, the walls of the channel. So wherever you have upgoing flows, you have a minimum in friction. Wherever the flows go down here, you have a maximum in friction. This is a cross section of the channel flow is, uh, is, 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 is entering into the plane of the, of the, of the screen in here. Uh, the origin of these secondary currents is still um, 
it's still uh, um, under investigation. Um, there are different ways to m interpret their, their appearance. And one way to do that is to write down the, um, the transport of vorticity equation, well, longitudinal vor vorticity, okay? So the vorticity that has a direction perpendicular, vector is perpendicular to the screen, okay? And vorticity is something that quantifies locally uh, how much the flow is, is, is swirling, essentially, okay? Um, which is what a secondary current is. It's is just, is just a cell that is, that is uh, rotating. Uh, if you write down this equation, you see that the source term into the equation uh, depends on the difference between the, the variance of the vertical velocity component and the variance of the, um, of the lateral velocity component. The difference between the two, this anisotropy, it's a source term and generates longitudinal vorticity. Um, which in my opinion is really fascinating. This, this secondary current seems to be very, very similar in structure to tho those very large scale motions that I was showing earlier on. B but the link and the relation between the two is not fully understood. What really fascinates me is that these mean flow properties um, comes from turbulence. So essentially, secondary flows are, in my opinion, a, well, we are talking about secondary uh, flows in straight channels, are a mean flow characteristic of turbulent flows. If you don't have turbulence, they don't appear. And in my example, are a, a really, um, in my opinion, are an ex the secondary flows are an example of inverse energy cascade. If you remember at the beginning, you know, the energy cascade in turbulence goes from large eddies to small eddies, and the, eddy the energy, energy is velocity squared. That's what it is. The energy is taken by the mean flow and dissipated into heat, right? That's the energy cascade. Turbulence go to the mean flow and say, give me some energy, I'll dissipate it. In secondary uh, current world, you have uh, turbulence that is generating mean flow. So it's, a, it's a consistent with an inverse energy cascade, which uh, personally I don't fully understand. Um, but uh, as far as this lecture is concerned, uh, secondary currents do exist. I have measured myself, they've been measured in the field, in many laboratory apparatus. And, um, and, uh, and uh, they, they are typical in open channel flows, but they, in, in the truth is they appear in any fluid dynamic facility. Aerodynamics now they are they are discovering them in, in wind tunnels and say that <laughs> and uh, and I've got people now putting stripes of, of of roughness into into wind tunnels and say look I've got the secondary the, the secondary flows I said this has been known in open channel flows since the 80s. People do not communicate even in the same discipline. But anyway, that, that doesn't really matter. Uh, what really matters today is swimming in turbulent flows. So now we have learned a little bit. Um, what characterize turbulence in the field, in rivers, even in the, in the, in the simple, simplest example of an open channel flow in a laboratory, which usually has mm, rectangular channels and shallow water. So now we know what we are dealing with when we put, essentially, a fish in a flume. Okay. Um, now, um, when I uh, started thinking about the material for this, for this summer school, I said, uh, I remember this paper again by Vlad Nikora in 2003. At uh, that time he was in New Zealand. And uh, I, I thought it was very, very, well, it's an excellent paper uh, as usual from Vlad. And, uh, um, and it's a, a very nice example where swimming performance it's put, is put in the context of dimensional analysis. Uh, um, and, uh, and, 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 and analyzed from a fluid dynamics perspective as well as a dimensional analysis perspective. So I really uh, thought it was consistent with the topics covered in this, in this school and, uh, and a very good example to explain how, uh, what are the problems related to understanding uh, swimming performance in turbulent flows. Okay, so it's just an example. We will go through this. Uh, there are many other papers, and uh, we will see that they show actually contradictory results. So you will see today, I will not give you answers. I will present only open questions, essentially. If you in, in this science, there very little is known. I would say it's, uh, in, uh, it, it is in its infancy. But anyway, 
let's go back to uh, the question. How does wall-generated, bed-generated uh, turbulence affect swimming performance? So in this paper, they've used uh, uh, a species which is specific in New Zealand, which is the Galaxias maculatus. You don't find it here in Europe, but uh, obviously New Zealand has a strong ecological relevance. Uh, pardon me a second. And uh, what they decided to do is, right, I want to know how turbulence affects swimming performance, so I'll do time to fatigue tests. This time to fatigue test is, uh, uh, I mean, involves putting, um, establishing a flow in a flume with a given mean velocity, putting the fish inside in the water. There is a very precise protocol to do that, but let's leave it aside for a moment. And measure the time it takes for the fish to get knackered, to get really tired and impinged in a screen you usually put downstream to. Uh, to catch the fish when he's too tired, essentially. Okay, so again, you put the fish in the flow, you, you you time it, you see how long it can swim at a given flow velocity. That's a time to fatigue test. Nothing else. They've done that. They use this flume, a very small flume, to be honest. Um, they kept the flow depth constant. They put a couple of screens to contain the fish while swimming, and they've used two treatments. Essentially, they've done experiments. Um, with putting some sort of rough walls in the lateral, uh, so, sorry, they put some roughness in the lateral walls, and then they did an experiment with smooth walls, okay? And they've used a large number of fish to have some sort of um, statistically relevant results, statistically robust results, okay? And fish were of different uh, dimensions. LF stands for fork length. It's nothing but the length of the fish from the snout to tail nothing else. And uh, the size of the fish was five to nine centimeters, essentially. So small fish in a small flume seems to be fine. They also measured uh, um, the turbulence characteristics of the flow inside the te this test section, which are obviously uh, heterogeneous because um, these screens are essenti essentially grids that create some sort of grid turbulence right downstream then the flow gets influenced totally by the roughness or by the, 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 the walls containing the water mm, itself. Um, so turbulence properties and mean flow properties vary a little bit along the, um, along the test section. They monitor them very, very carefully. And just to give you an idea of what we are dealing with, um, I'm going to show you these plots. A K is the turbulent kinetic energy. The turbulent kinetic energy, as you probably know, but just to refresh, is the energy of the turbulent fluctuations. So it's the sum of, this, of the variances of all the um, uh, velocity fluctuations in the, f in, the, in, the, in the test section. Field symbols are associated with smooth wall uh, channel experiments where are empty symbols with the rough channel. So you can see that the rough channels has, in general, these are turbulent kinetic energy versus mean longitudinal velocity, uh, which varies in different locations. You can tell that uh, overall, within the test section, the, the macroscopic difference between the two treatments is that one is more turbulent, or more energy is contained into turbulence than the other. So that they could isolate the effect of turbulent and see whether the time to fatigue of fish depended so if there was a difference between the two treatments. So it was a very good idea. Um, and so they did. <laughs> and they came up with these with this, um, interesting results. What you are seeing is, is a plot of the velocity of, of water, which they demonstrated essentially um, coincides with the velocity of fish. So, I mean, well, the relative velocity of fish with respect to water, okay? So overall, the velocity of fish with respect to water was the mean velocity of water because the fish was holding station all the time, essentially, moving very little. Yeah, so that's it. And uh, on the x-axis, we have the time to fatigue. So the, the, the time uh, it takes for a given velocity of the flow to the fish to get uh, impinged to the downstream um, screen. So when, when it gets too tired. And they have seen <coughs> two, uh, 
two, um, they've shown two uh, important, two main results. The first is about scale effects. It seems that all the large, uh, for a given U, for a given v even velocity of the flow, larger fish have time to fatigue that are larger than smaller fish. And this makes sense, is consistent with the introductory lecture uh, earlier on. A larger fish has more mass, has more power, it can sustain a high flow for longer. Very simple. Conversely, a smaller fish has less power and can sustain the same velocity for shorter times. Now, as you can see, this time to fatigue is, uh, consider only the data in this area, because this is where we go from seconds to minutes, which is the time interval which is consistent with the definition of burst velocity, of maximum velocity, okay? What we call, what we addressed at the beginning. So those velocities that the fish can sustain for short times, okay? That's what we are interested in ecologically and uh, from an engineering point of view. These other experimental points belong to this prolonged swimming activity, which is something in between the cruising and the, and the burst, which is uh, unknown territory, so they, they were kind of neglected. So I was saying there is this first result about scale effects, and uh, this is, uh, the interestingly, is the, the authors argue that this is due to physiological effects, so power and mass, which we already uh, discussed, there is also Reynolds number effect. Uh, you probably know that uh, um, the, 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 the resistance coefficient of, of a body immersed in a moving fluid, so the friction factor, the, the, the drag coefficient, decreases with increasing Reynolds number. Yep. So at lower Reynolds number, you have higher uh, drag coefficients, and therefore smaller fish, which are, have a lower Reynolds number be simply because they are smaller, they are exposed to a higher drag coefficient, right? So this contributes them to get them tired earlier than larger fish that instead have a larger Reynolds number. So, but overall, uh, these results show that what really matters is the size of the fish, so it's the length, for example, which is a good proxy for, for, for mass and for power, and the uh, Reynolds number. Whenever the Reynolds number kicks in, it means that viscosity effects are relevant, okay? So viscosity plays a role, the size of the fish do play a role. The second result, which was very, very surprising, is that these experimental results are um, not, um, show no turbulence effects whatsoever. So there is no stratification of data points uh, between turbulent, so smooth, uh, sorry, very turbulent, which means the rough wall, the rough wall experiment and the, the less turbulent, let's call it, which is the, sw the, the, the smooth wall experiment. There is no stratification of data, the points are mixed, which suggests the fact that uh, turbulence has no effect, at least turbulence intensity, which varied a lot between the two treatments, seems to have no effect on the swimming performance of these species. And this is a little bit in contrast with um, some uh, previous literature by Pavlov et al, uh, 2000, although the original paper was in Russian, which I cannot read, uh, in mid-90s, I don't remember. But they have shown that actually, for another fish, uh, whose Latin name I don't remember, uh, um, d d d turbulence did have an effect. So is it species dependent? Uh, the other issue is that these experiments by Pavlov et al were carried out um, in a different way, not with the time to fatigue test, but with the, what is called the critical velocity test, which is not directly comparable with this test. So bottom line is, it's an open question. This bad generated turbulence that we have learned uh, that we have described a few minutes ago, does it or does, does not, it, it, it does an, ex an, an effect on swimming performance or not? Not clear. It's it definitely not clear. Um, the authors went on and did some, uh, um, we will come back to this point later on. But anyway, the, um, the authors decided to, to use this wealth of experimental data to do, um, to do some, uh, to, to build a predictive formula linking velocity with time to fatigue and all the other uh, relevant variables in the, in the problem. So if you remember, we said it seems that the time to fatigue and the burst speed depends on viscosity, because the results are dependent on Reynolds number, on fork length, 
There you go. So burst speed depends on viscosity, burst length, time to fatigue, as we know from the previous graph, and a little bit of inertia. So they put gravity into the, um, into the uh, equation. After dimensional analysis, using the Buckingham theorem, they developed a functional, um, sorry, a series of non-dimensional groups, uh, which are related by functional relationship F. And the dimensional analysis shows that uh, the, the burst speed is um, normalized, forming a non-dimensional group, which is essentially the square of the fruit number of the fish. Okay, Fruit number is, is a velocity scale normalized by the square root of gravity multiplied by characteristic length scale. This is the square of it. And this is a function of the fish Reynolds number, nicely. And another non-dimensional parameter, which uh, has mm, no name, I would interpret it as the ratio between gravity and uh, the mean acceleration of the fish swimming in the chamber. It doesn't have a name. They did an incomplete similarity assumption following Barenblatt uh, theory, and they related the fish fruit number to uh, a, uh, the Reynolds number through a power law with an exponent that needs to be found empirically. There is no way to find these exponents theoretically. And a function f um, associated with this uh, no-name dimensional number. And they did some uh, sort of empirical fitting, and they came up with this with this, uh, with this law that allows to collapse the data fairly, fairly well. And this is, um, this is um, interesting because they have now developed an equation that can be used for fish management and fish, design and fish pass design. So once you have your velocity in the channel, which is your design parameter, so you decide, OK, I want to design the channel so that its steepness and, and the roughness that I put in determines this velocity u. Then I I go to this graph, I know the, 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 the time to fatigue, I know the size of the fish, I can work out whether the fish pass is well designed or not. So very, very useful um, uh, development uh, out of dimensional analysis and experiments on fish. Um, going back to the previous question on why no turbulence effects uh, are shown in the experiments, the authors, uh, uh, let's say, they put on the table various, various um, hypotheses, and they actually say that uh, um, essentially in the experiments they've done, they have varied only the uh, turbulence intensity, so the, the strength of the fluctuations in the flow. That's what that means. Okay? They did not vary the size of the eddies because the flow depth was kept constant. If you remember, these large-scale motions, these sca large-scale eddies that really influence swimming performance scale with the flow depth. So between one treatment and the other, presumably the scale of the large eddies was the same. And in any, uh, if you, I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the fluid mechanics literature, uh, whenever you investigate the effect of turbulence on, uh, on, uh, on the drag on a body, you vary two things, the size of the eddies and the intensity of the eddies. Okay? Fish makes no ex exception, uh, apparently, and so they say, okay, this study is probably incomplete because we didn't test different um, uh, the sizes. Um, and they say there should be a wider range of um, experiments covering a wider range uh, of uh, mm, a non-dimensional number built as the ratio between the eddy length and uh, the size of the fish. Um, which makes sense, I liked it, but my criticism on that, actually they did, because, okay, the eddies in the flow were always the same, but the fish changed in size, actually, there, was, there were 5 centimeters fish and 10 centimeters fish, yet there is no effect of turbulence on the time to fatigue. So either we need to explore a wider range, but uh, I'm not sure, um, or perhaps turbulence simply has no effect which is counterintuitive if you think about it. Um, okay, I'm talking about bad generated turbulence. So turbulent boundary layers, uh, sorry, boundary layer turbulence in here. Wakes, uh, mixing layers may have a completely different uh, uh, effect. But as far as bad generated turbulence is concerned, there seems to be no effect on, on fish swimming performance. 
Um, we have touched bed generated turbulence. What about wakes? So the, the, the turbulence generated by downstream of, of, of objects, you know, um, does it influence swimming performance or behavior of fish? This is what I'm going to talk next. And this is the topic that uh, was um, addressed by James Liao, who, who is a big name in this field, who did very nice experiments showing uh, really fascinating results. And what he did, he said, OK, let's start from the simplest case of a wake generated by a cylinder. Actually, use the half cylinder just to fix the separation point. Okay? That means the size of the eddies was always, uh, it did not depend on the Reynolds number, essentially. Okay? Um, so he put this half cylinder uh, within a flume, established some water flows, he put um, and his co-workers, of course, um, I think trouts in the, in the flume, and started monitoring uh, the behavior, well, the behavior, the, the, the swimming kinematics of these trouts, so the, the oscillations of the body, of the, of the caudal fin, and so forth. And um, he varied a lot the size between, uh, uh, sorry, the ratio between the fish body length and the diameter of the of the cylinder so that he could generate different eddy shedding frequencies and the size at the sizes okay but okay forget about all these details what was really really interesting to observe is that fish fishes tend to stay to hold station let's say um, one or two body lengths downstream of the cylinders away from the low pressure region where the vortices is formed, where there is really separation, um, synchronizing the tail beat to the eddy shedding. So there was this, ed this cylinder here generating these eddies, and the, the fish was doing zigzagging among the eddies. Okay? And what he observed is that the muscular activity of the fish while staying in this, in this wake was almost zero. Like the fish could be dead and do that and, and use no energy whatsoever to hold position. And fish actually do that even in, in, uh, in rivers. So when they are tired, they go, they, they, they find a log or, or an object that generates these eddies and they rest. They stay there. Fascinating. Now, <coughs> this is a peculiar um, behavior of fish. Uh, which is actually dictated by the lateral line. Without the lateral line, they struggle to do it. Um, clearly, fish could save energy even staying in the in the in the in the suction region just downstream of the of the of the cylinder, like the cyclists do during a race. Okay, you want to to save some energy, you stay in the wake of the person in front of you. But that's not the case. That's not what is uh, making them saving energy. It's really the interaction between the eddies generated by the cylinder and the kinematics and the swimming of the, of the fish, which is tuned to, to essentially do a slalom among eddies. So exploit the eddy to save energy. And the way this is explained is as following. Imagine um, figure, uh, well, uh, panel A of this figure that is a counterclockwise um, eddy, which is shed by this cylinder. The green arrow determines this, the, the, um, the direction of the incident flow that the, that the fish experiences, which will uh, hit, the, well, the fish will adjust having an angle of attack. This angle of attack will determine <coughs> the fish, uh, will impose to the fish essentially a, a drag force here, this arrow here, which is a parallel to the incident flow, and a lift force, which is perpendicular to the incident flow. These forces give a net green, I'm a bit colorblind. This is green, right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, the, the green force there, uh, which is the, the, the sum of the drag and the lift force, um, that have a component upwards and, uh, and, uh, and a longitudinal component, which is just enough to win the drag experienced by the fish. So essentially, here the fish is moved only um, upwards. Okay? It stays in the same longitudinal position, but is moving up. When the eddy travels and, uh, and, and, and is essentially next to the fish, 
uh, the, the incident flow is in this direction, uh, identified by the gray arrow. And at this very small angle of attacks, you have, uh, you have a essentially very small drag and large lift, which determine a force, a total force that has only a vertical component. So again, the fish tends to go, uh, tends to go down. And again, when uh, the clockwise uh, head is, is, is shed again, this process uh, uh, is exactly the same. There is a lift force, it's just uh, the, the, the signs are, are opposite and the flow, the, the fish tends to go down and then up again, depending on the, on the, on the, on the, um, uh, the vorticity uh, sign of, of the edges. So that's, that's the, the, the current hypothesis to explain this behavior. What is really fascinating is that the fish can adjust the angle of attack and to essentially um, generate this system of drag and lift forces to hold position, spending almost no energy whatsoever, which is, um, which is truly fascinating. I think I have, yeah, I do, a video showing you some experiment that are meant. This is the, the James Liao website where you can find all these uniform flow. So this is the Karman gating. There you go. That's how the fish moves. And this is the fish footprint overlap to some PAV measurement, so the flow field measurement. That's what the fish does. It essentially, they do slalom among eddies. And what, what's really interesting is this video of a dead trout in flowing water. And there you go, this is no flow, and the flow kicks in. When the flow kicks in, come on. You can tell it's dead. Okay. So the, the dead fish start to do karma gating anyway. Which is which is very strong proof that there is no energy spent there <laughs> simply because the fish is dead. Okay. Okay. Now, so we have learned how fish exploit vortices or turbulence to save energy, and this is one of the of the the, the few results actually we know. Um, clearly, whenever we deal with such coherent eddies. Everything is a lot easier. When we go back to the bed generated turbulence, we have IRP eddies, we have large scale motions that are packets of eddies, then very large scale motions, outer layers, log layer is a lot more complicated. But in this case, it's, it's a, I think it's a nice study to show how clever are fish to exploit turbulence and, and, uh, and uh, how capable is the lateral line uh, to actually uh, detect these flow fields. Fish again, are extremely uh, uh, good experimentalists, fluid dynamics experimentalists, because they really can measure flow fields and exploit them uh, to save energy. Okay, again, not much, now we are, we are not going to talk much about uh, uh, turbulence, but just mean flow properties of, of the, of, um, that, uh, that can be exploited by fish to save energy. One of these energy saving strategies is called entrainment and is always associated again with a flow field generated uh, by a half cylinder or a semi-infinite uh, body like this with a, with a round head, okay? Similar to this, um, this half cylinder uh, uh, above. So uh, this is the work by uh, Horst Blackman that I mentioned earlier on and, and co-workers. And again, like Liao, they did experiments with uh, some fish they put this half cylinder or this other element in a flume and they observed fish behavior. And they, they, they just checked where fish like to stay. And they observed that fish really like to stay in proximity of this half cylinder, not too far, with an angle, with, with a, bit, a little bit of an angle of attack with respect of the, of the mean flow. And they did also some numerical simulations, uh, some, uh, but also measurements, detailed measurements of the flow field when the fish is actually staying in this position. And what they notice is that the fish stays there 
and the muscular activity again is very very much reduced so it's definitely an energy saving strategy and what happens here is that the flow in proximity of the of the cylinder is slightly deflected which uh, contribute to um, generate an angle of attack of the, mm, the airfoil fish, let's call it. And uh, the interaction between this flow and the fish with this angle of attack, genera attack generates some sort of a system of lift and drag forces as usual, which generates a total force uh, upwards indicated by this arrow. However, this, uh, so in principle, this should move away the fish. Fish should, should not be able to hold the position. What happens is that uh, uh, this force is counterbalanced by the very low, um, the very low um, pressure generated here, because here the flow is going is, is squeezed between the this half cylinder and the fish, so accelerate in the middle. High velocity, low pressure, so low. Uh, 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 um, so, so essentially, this, this total force is counterbalanced, but is but is low pressure in, in here. So the the fish is actually able to stay to to hold position in there. Unfortunately, the eddy shedding of the of the of the half cylinder makes this position a little bit unstable. So the fish would stay there for a bit, but then it would be dragged away by an eddy because you know you have eddies moving, uh, eddy shedding around, which uh, which makes uh, um, the stability of of fish challenging. So th that's why they did the semi-infinite body experiment where the fish could stay in proximity of this half cylinder head, but without the eddy shedding. And then they noticed that the fish again liked really to stay sort of in a similar position, uh, and it was a lot more stable. Um, um, and this is called entrainment. Please remember this word. It will be very, very useful for this afternoon when we talk about uh, my own research. We will need that. So far, we have seen Karman gating and entrainment as strategies for energy, um, energy um, saving uh, to hold the station. The last one is called bow wake riding, and it was observed by Liao once again. And uh, essentially, what happens is that if you have a flow going upwards, again in the flume, and there is this half cylinder that behaves simply as an obstacle, fish really tended to stay just in front of the of the of this cylinder and it really showed a reduced muscular activity so in, in simple words a reduced energy expenditure as well but the reason why is not entirely clear to me um, i the day justify that because here there is a due to the uh, impinging flow in proximity of the cylinder there is a reduced velocity and so a reduced drag uh, that's what they say. I don't think this, this gives the complete picture, but that's what we know. What's, what happens for sure is that in front of the cylinder, uh, the tail beat frequency, the, the, the muscular activity of the fish, and therefore the energy expenditure is definitely low. So to summarize, after Liao 2000, the beautiful review of Liao 2007, uh, we have um, three energy saving strategies that are known at the moment um, with respect to a fish swimming in a uniform flow, a fish that does bow wake riding, um, entrainment or carman gating experiences uh, much less uh, um, uh, energy expenditure. Please do remember these, these, uh, these uh, aspects because we'll be used this afternoon to uh, talk about uh, um, space use and uh, habitat selection in trouts uh, um, in my own uh, uh, research. Again, this is a list of reference that you can consult to, to go a little bit uh, to dig deeper in what we have just uh, discussed. Uh, and uh, that's it for this morning. If there are questions, I'm happy to discuss. Okay, thanks. <laughs>